Okay, well, let me say, let me issue a disclaimer. Uh, first up, I should say, I own a lot of gold, and I own um, quite a few gold mining companies as well. And in terms of a kind of balanced portfolio, I am way overweight gold. That said, I like to kind of hedge my portfolio by talking about as negatively as, about gold as I possibly can. Um, and uh, I think it's really important to, I mean, I imagine there's a lot of gold bugs in the room. In fact, I know there are a lot of gold bugs in the room because I, you know, I know so many of you. And I think there's so many kind of received uh, beliefs about gold. And I think it's really important to keep challenging them because otherwise you come unstuck. And that's what happened to you know, quite a few of us in the bear market that's, that's just taken place and may still be ongoing, we are yet to see. Um, and I challenge the idea, man, that gold is money. Uh, it all depends on what your definition of money is. Now, it, the standard definition of, of what money is, is unit of, unit of account, store of wealth, uh, means of exchange. Now, sure, gold is money in the sense that it's a store of wealth. It's a fantastic store of wealth. It's constant, lasts forever, yada, yada. It's also a fantastic unit of account. In fact, it's a much better unit of account than dollars or pounds or anything like that. It's a much better way to um, you know, look at the relative value of markets over the long term. But is it, it's not a means of payment. Sure, you've got things like Bitgold over here, but uh, you know, Alistair's company, um, you know, so you can buy and sell stuff with gold if you really want to. But the reality is, it's not, it, it, only a very small amount of time is it a medium, a medium of exchange. And if you say to people, what is money? To most people, money is something that you buy stuff with and sell stuff with. And that is not gold's role. And in fact, I would say it's not been gold's role to do that for, you could argue, 500 years since the, since the arrival of paper money. You know, money is tech. And people use, to buy and sell stuff, they use whatever is the most convenient thing. And, you know, paper became more convenient than gold, so people started using paper. Sure, we used gold sovereigns up until 1914. But, you know, the, the majority of large transactions would take place with paper. And then checks started replace, replacing paper, and then electronic banking started replacing checks, and so on and so forth. So that's one argument I get you to challenge. But as a store of wealth, you know, gold can be fantastic, but it wasn't very good if you bought it in 1980 at $850 an ounce. It was a rotten store of wealth, because 20 years later it was $250. Uh, meanwhile, everything else had gone up. And that, you know, the same thing applied in 2011. If you, rolled out gold in 2011 and bought stocks, my goodness me, how much money would you have? But if you stayed in gold, you just watched stocks and houses go up in value while gold went down, and you, you were kind of losing money on both sides. So, you know, it's a very good store of value if you time it right. In terms of the timing of starting a fund, investing in junior gold mining companies, I think the timing could not be better. Um, the the, the value that is given to mining assets at the moment is is that they are incredibly cheap. They're still, you know, good mining assets are still very rare. Um, and juniors tend to move later in the cycle. You've already seen quite a big move in the seniors and in the, in the better um, uh, producing junior companies. But in terms of the explorers, the development companies, um, you know, there's a shed load of opportunities out there. And, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, maybe gold's gonna go back to $900 or something, or maybe it'll stay above 1050, or maybe it'll carry on the run that it's on and go up to 1500. Nobody knows, you can make the argument for both. But, you know, I think we're probably 10 or 20% off the low for junior mining assets. But, you know, they can go up many, many hundred percent. And so I think that, in terms of in starting up a junior fund, I, I think your time is fantastic. And, um, and you know, when gold goes up, juniors can fly, and there is no more exciting feeling in the whole world than owning a junior mining company that is going up and going up and going up. It is a fantastic feeling. But then, you, sometimes the payback is when it goes down. <laughs> 
which is a brutal sensation. Um, ask me a question, Amanda, because I, I can feel myself rambling. <laughs> well, timing-wise, I mean, I agree. Gold, having looked at the history of gold, it's gone down as many times as it's gone up. Yeah. Um, and we, I think most of us in this room believe that it's probably the time for it to go up again. But how do you hedge yourself against the really crappy junior miners, frankly? Well, I mean, you just, you don't buy them. And it's, it's really hard because, you know, a lot of the time you go, I came into junior mining in 2004, 2005, around about then. And, you know, I didn't really know who anyone was. And, you know, all, all company, it didn't matter what you could put money into anything, it went up. And uh, it's only kind of now am I discovering, you know, two or three years ago, how much moose pasture and how uneconomic a lot of these projects were. So it, it's very difficult. But fortunately, we didn't really have it as much in 2005 as we do now. We've got this wonderful thing called the internet. And, uh, you know, the amount of information, it's really not hard to find out how viable a project is or how kosher a particular person is or isn't using the internet and just do a bit of Google search and see what people say. And it's, there's some pretty revealing stuff there. So I've used the internet, but again, you know, everyone at this table, I mean, everyone in this room, we all know who, you know, we all talk to people in mining, we've all dealt with people in mining. Um, it's a pretty small world. You get to know who everyone is and who the dodgy customers are pretty quickly, who's genuine, who's good in a certain environment, who's bad in another environment. So you can't be personal contact as well, but you know the internet is a fantastic resource, and I would recommend using that. Um, you know, you, you just need to look at the performance. I mean, I, I haven't really been looking that closely over the last few weeks, but I know you know some companies, of, like Rangold or Pan African Resources or McEwen Mining or Lakeshore Gold. You know, some of these companies like that, which you know quality companies at, at the level they're offered, they've absolutely flown. And then you look at some others, you know, I'm thinking Aureus Mining, oh my goodness me, what a disaster that would be. Maybe I shouldn't name or shame, but, you know, to hell with it, we, we will, we'll do it. And, um, you know, there are various other companies, and it's, you know, when the mark, you know, people say buy GDX or buy GDXJ, which is the ETF where all the juniors are listed, but half the companies on GDXJ are rubbish. And so you're buying an index fund. So I think um, it really does pay at this stage in the market to have a good stock picker. But then what happens when gold bull markets get going is that everything flies, even the crap flies. And um, so it, it, it does your head in because you think, what's the point of analysing this and doing all this when I just see that bloke and I know that bloke's dodgy and I know that mine is crap. I know it's never going to be built. It's never going to make any money. And do you know what? It's just gone up 300%. It makes you despair, but that, these are the sort of emotions that you go through. Um, so, but Amanda knows everyone. She told me not to buy Aureus. I did, and she was right, and I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Why don't we let uh, Richard, who's been investing for a very long time, and I'm sure has many more stories like that to tell, give us a go. Oh, and what we're talking about. Most people in this room, who come to a meeting like this, were nearly always interested in gold balls. But that's not the representation of the city. Uh, and to give an example, about two years ago, I put some money into St. James's Place, 85 billion under management, and every year they send you the, the document that outlines the 43 funds they've invested in, and it gives you their views on life. So I went through it as, much, as, as intricately as I could, and the most amazing thing is they mentioned gold, the word gold once in passing, but not one fund manager, fund manager mentioned it. So I, and they send you a report and they said, tell us what you're thinking. So I went back and I said, well, I'm absolutely amazed that given the state of Europe as it is at the moment, the fact that the Middle East could well implode at any time, the fact that no one believes a word that comes out of China because they can't be going at 7 cents because everyone goes and tells you that it looks terrible. Um, I said, why don't you cover gold? And they came back and said, because we don't. 85 billion under management don't cover gold. And our somebody also has their money um, with hard repair, and it was a similar sort of story. They've got the same sort of money under management, and a similar sort of story. Gold is not covered. And I think one of the reasons is that those of us are bullish on the gold price have been made to feel intellectually inferior. It, it's one of these things that it's, it's beneath the dignity of most investors, and that's the proof of it. These are every major farmer group you'll think of is represented in this book. 
So I said, well, hold on, you know, there must be a time when you're going to realize if you, if you take it just for the sake of argument, if you put 12 months ago to this day all your money into gold, and I'm not suggesting one second you would, you'd have outperformed the FTSE by a very wide margin. Well, no one's going to do that. So then you take a stock, you take Rand, Rand Gold, Rand Gold, 66 quid today, um, just about doubled in the last year, 50 times earnings, 50 times earnings for a gold company, and virtually all of its gold comes out of Mali, Mali in the west of Africa, divided into two, don't go north of Timbuktu, because you probably won't come back again. So not the greatest country in the world, but a very well run, run gold company. And then I took the third step, was if you're really feeling brave, and many of the people in the book have mentioned Australia, and South Africa, and Canada, if you bought gold shares in this country, in these countries, you could have easily made 10 times your money. It sounds outrageous, but I can give you plenty of examples of what happened. And it still got exactly the same response. They weren't interested. And I think that's what we're facing here. I think most of us do believe that gold is a, an alternative to what we're seeing at the moment, but we've been made to feel that it's just not the right thing to have your money in. So we're not represented. Go and speak to all the major fund managers, and you'll find the real story. And that's why I'm so bullish, because hardly anyone covers it. And even in Australia, well, we don't have a mining psyche because we're not a mining country as such. But Australia most certainly is. And it's only in the last three or four months that the gold shares have started performing there. And now, it's only 20% of all the, all the stock market turnover in Australia is gold shares. But I should think about a year ago, it wouldn't have been 5%, probably less. So you don't have to fill this inferiority complex because you're going in gold. And when it comes to selection, some of the great gains have already been done. I mentioned Randall. If you take the leaders in America or North America, generally, um, Gold Corp, uh, Newmont, Kinross, Barrack, they're probably all on 30 to 40 times earnings. So there has been a subculture of people who have worked it out for themselves and bought these things. But how many times do you pick up the papers and fight? Oh, a gold investment's been a very good one. Sean Merrin mentions it every now and then, but she only writes about it every six months. It's about time we got a Lex column. They've always been bearish. Whatever happens to gold, they're bearish. And they're probably due for another time, telling us why it's going to go down again. But in any country apart from America, it's been a great investment. And I think it's going to continue to be so. I, in my 50 odd years in the city, I always say I never have known less of what's going on. I'm totally confused by everything I see. I can't work out how, how people look at themselves when they look at Europe and when they say, Unemployment in, in Spain, youth unemployment is, is 50%. And somehow we've got to feel inferior. I can't see why we, we have to sort of put money into Europe so they can tell us what to do. It's the same with investing. You've got to make up your own mind. I think that's why we're here. Most of us have made up our own mind, and it's the choice of stocks, which perhaps we'll discuss later, that is the most relevant point. I've got to say, having uh, been a gold analyst and a mining analyst for about 10 years now, that uh, that has been one thing that has bothered me so much through that period. And I think I've, I've been bearish gold, bullish gold at various times, but the uh, the fact that you have the general salesman who says, why would you invest in gold? You know, Warren Buffett said, gold's the worst place to ever put your money in. There's just an inbuilt belief that's out there, which I, I agree with you 100%, that there's something, there's something unsophisticated about gold. And I think that with the uh, the amount of sophistication that we've seen that's, that's developed over the last 40 years in terms of the way that the policymakers are getting more and more, uh, you know, getting and having more intervention than they've had before, I think there's going to be a rebalancing of that that happens at some point. Um, for, for me, I think for gold right now, I think we're, we're largely through the uh, the down cycle. I'm not convinced that it's, that it's over just yet. I think the real rates uh, argument, Amanda, that you brought up, I think is absolutely crucial to this uh, to gold. If you look at the correlations, when real rates are moving upwards, gold is not doing well. When the real rates going down, it's doing uh, it, it does very well. And uh, we've seen rising real rates over the last three, four years. Uh, we're not yet to a point where we would have been back in the 2000s or in the 1990s. So there's still uh, room for that on a long-term sort of basis to go back. But, um, and I think also the other thing that's happened is, is that the world has changed a lot in terms of the, the monetary infrastructure in the last uh, three to four years on the back of the U.S. shale revolution. 
And instead of having dollars flowing out to the world, now the money is coming to the US. And so that does change things to an extent that I think we're still working through those. Uh, but what I would say is, is that the imbalances that we've built up over these last eight years, and especially the policymakers' low interest rates and suppression of interest rates has created a lot of misallocation of capital, and China's probably the best example. We've seen massive amounts of uh, funds moving to emerging markets where you see um, the, the, capital, the, the capital allocation process not as mature. So we've built up a lot of these imbalances that I think are going to need to, uh, to unwind, and that is going to lead to a level of uncertainty, which I think uh, I agree with Richard right now. I, I, it, is, it has become so much more complicated. I, I watch on the trading floor every day. You see companies like BHP Billiton moving up and down 10%. There's no way that there's a $15 billion difference on a daily basis between the companies <coughs> in the morning and the evening. But that's what's happening, and I think it's because there's a, a very uh, big uncertainty. And one of those reasons is, what are the implications of negative interest rates? How does the world, how does the banking system work in this environment? And so I think this uncertainty is really starting to cause a bit of a paradigm shift where investors are going to start looking for alternative um, investments. Um, in the near term, uh, I think you have to remember in 2008 when we had the crisis, gold didn't do well right off the bat. Um, it took the policymakers' response to be able to get there. You have, uh, when global deleveraging happens, everything can. Uh, can, uh, can go down um, at the same time, but I guess it's on a relative basis where gold would do, and you can imagine in an environment like this, gold would, uh, would outperform. Um, the, uh, the positioning argument for gold right now, I think, is probably one of the strongest it has ever been. Um, the sentiment towards gold had probably reached a, a, the, the high in probably, I'd imagine, in the middle of 2015, maybe early 20. Uh, 2015, and since then you're starting to see a bit of a shift, but I think investors are not positioned for it, and especially, as, as Richard says, uh, serious, uh, serious money has not got to what is a relatively thin space. So there is that uh, definitely in favor of, of the next cycle. Um, I guess lastly what I'd say about the gold equities is, is that this industry over a 20-year period, um, it, it got to a point where you were not having the proper capital allocation decisions being made. The businesses were not set up to be able to provide returns on capital. It was about growing uh, rather than anything else. And I think that that has changed dramatically. Uh, that whole U.S. shale revolution has caused emerging market currencies to fall. Uh, it's caused your oil prices to fall as well, which is causing the, uh, the costs for the producers to be much lower than they used to be. Uh, producers have done an admirable job of being able to cut out the costs of their businesses, change the businesses to be able to be profitable at lower levels. And uh, because of the lack of uh, faith in, the, in, the, in gold and, and the fall in prices, we've not seen capital being put into the, uh, into, the, uh, into the new mines, which means that right now, from the company's perspective, they have, they have a lot of free cash flow, more free cash flow than they normally would have. Um, this has uh, also led to a lack of, uh, a lack of exploration and, uh, and, and development opportunities, which should lead to a cycle of M&A, especially as some of these multiples in these companies for the seniors are getting to points where at 40 times earnings, your paper is worth quite a lot to be able to do deals. So I think we are probably uh, on the cusp of a, of a pretty interesting cycle for the gold uh, gold market. I don't know if it's going to be happening overnight, but in terms of positioning as an investor, having a, having a significant uh, holding of gold, or at least a, a, a proportional holding of gold, seems to me to be a very prudent uh, prudent way of uh, position just from a long-term risk perspective. Thank you very, <coughs> very much for coming and, and uh, it's very, been an interesting day because not only is there this excellent uh, seminar here today, but JP Morgan had a long one this afternoon in the dial in, uh, which I managed to listen to, and uh, just shows that the interest is really there again. JP Morgan, having been one of the <coughs> two big American banks that were very anti the gold market today, they were very much more positive. I am uh, the blithering idiot, because uh, that's what we were told I was, and uh, in terms of, of Randgill, I am, not many people know this, a uh, life member of the Union of Mine Workers in Mali. I invested in Mali in a small way, and then I invested in, ran away with the whole lot in a week. So you can make mistakes, and, and I obviously have made several. Um, 
but it's more complicated uh, <coughs> to run these businesses than, uh, than you would imagine. Um, looking at the idea of St. James's Place and the fact they don't have go, the problem I always had with places like St. James's Place is they charge you a fee and they are investing in other funds which are also charging you a fee, so I'm afraid I would never buy anything like that. But it's bad enough. Um, and we pay the fees to the Zoe change and the brokers here. But having on a regular basis taken away from you by the, <coughs> by the fund managers is really too high. Um, the, other, the other point which um, I think is, is interesting that our first speaker spoke about, um, that you can find out so much on the internet about people. Well, you can, um, but you have absolutely no certainty that it's true. About this time last year, we were doing the torturous refinancing of Petro Public. And one of the biggest problems that I had was the massive short selling of the company's shares. About 35% of the company was sold short. And the way this was Cheap was by people making up stories, rumours, and what have you, inside information that wasn't inside information, and it was all negative. And nice people who uh, wished that they could see my body floating down the river, and all that sort of thing. It was a real troll work. So I don't believe a single word that, that, you, that you read on the, uh, on the internet. It's just practice, uh, first uh, <coughs> man, terrorist. Um, I think there are good ones and there are bad ones, and um, there are actually only relatively few words the matter in the mining industry, three in my view, tons and grade. And if you've got the tons and got the grade, it's very difficult to make a mess of it. That's how I started with Petra Pavlos, nine grams a ton on the surface and no stripping. Uh, and that's how we, <coughs> how we got going. In terms of the gold market itself, though, I think that, uh, and, and before I became a miner, I was heavily involved. I was uh, probably the Soviet Union's biggest gold trading counterparty, and I traded with central banks around the world. I financed jewelers in Antigua, and I financed jewelers in Vicenza uh, <coughs> and uh, Arezzo, um, and all the whole panoply of, of the gold market, because I was uh, deputy managing director of one of the big five, McGavin and Goldsmith. Um, in terms of whether the gold is uh, money or not, I think we told it wasn't because it wasn't a medium of exchange. Not many of you probably know that until about 1960, all international air tickets were settled in gold francs. That was the, only, that was the way the, the system worked. So it, it was, and, and, and often has been, a, a wonderful medium of exchange. Uh, and, and it was, it was a, a, very, a very popular thing to do. I actually thought I'd bring some proof of that, because deep down inside here, I have a Roman coin that buys as much bread today uh, as it did when it was minted in what is now Belgium in, in the year zero, about the time Christ was born. Um, and I think that if you're going to be involved in the gold business, you want to have the real stuff. I think actually that the risks of, of buying uh, all mining companies right at this moment are still very, very high because there is a lot of uncertainty, in, in not only in the operations, but also the political risk of where you are and what you're doing. And I think the point is very carefully well made about money because that it seems to me at a relatively unstable place, as indeed are so many places in Africa. So if you're buying gold by the, by the real stuff, and Sharps Pixley has just opened this wonderful new shop on Thomas and James Street where you can go in and buy and sell gold uh, and store it there. It's well worth going to have a look at it. It opened uh, about a week, two weeks ago. Uh, and you should definitely, definitely go and have a look at that. Um, China is, 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 is the key. 29% of, of, the, of the world go consumed there. Don't forget that it's a huge importer, but it's also the biggest producing country in the world. So that is a really remarkable situation. And the government took a, 
a very strange decision, which was to encourage its people to buy the cattle, not only as a state bank, but the, the gold coming out of the, going through the Shanghai Exchange, physical gold is enormous. And for the people who look as if they're going to have a, uh, a fall in the value of the renminbi who bought gold, um, they're going to look very smart and be, and be very grateful to the government who provided them to do that. India is about 25% of the world's consumption um, and also um, a very big and important um, uh, country. Russia itself is, is a big central bank buyer. Um, I haven't seen them buying uh, things or selling, selling things for gold, but they're certainly buying most of the stuff that, that we produce, about half a million, <coughs> about half a million ounces a year. Um, so last and least, not least, I actually do think the gold price is going to go up. I think that we have seen a situation and Amanda produced it uh, very interestingly about the, the, um, the way in which the United States has been managing uh, the gold price. This has been, it looks to me, and I've been in the gold market for 30 odd years, as if there has been some very strange things happening. The, the huge dumping of, of, of paper gold into a market that is shut physically shut because it's midnight uh, at a time of instability to keep the price down. And this is, seems to have changed. I think that they have become frightened. Um, I think that the, the ratio of available gold on the on COMEX for delivery and the number of uh, open interest contracts, which is, some people will tell you 500 to 1, some will tell you it's 400 to 1, but it's still a fantastic uh, risk for the system, a real big systemic risk, risk that I think you should worry about. And, and I would never buy ETFs because I don't think there's necessarily as much gold <coughs> in the ETFs as they, as they say there is because I think they lend it. Um, I, I've asked, uh, I asked the, one of the, the COMEX fault holders today, the London office of one of the uh, COMEX fault holders today, how quickly that they could transform the eligible gold, which is about six million ounces, uh, into uh, registered gold, which is about 290,000 ounces. Um, and he said, Dan I made, which wasn't very convincing. Um, and, so, and so I emailed, I emailed the Chicago Chicago Exchange Exchange to ask that question, and uh, we may yet get an answer uh, about that. Um, where will it go to in terms of price? Well, I think the I think the theory of a reset is 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 likely. I <coughs> I've always expected it. I saw gold. I correctly predicted gold would get to almost two thousand. I said it would get to two thousand. It got to nineteen thirty eight, uh, and then we saw this big smash down. I think we can well see two thousand again, and I think we could see it substantially higher. So that's my view. So I'd like to open it up. Does anybody have any questions? And feel free to direct them. Uh, yes, I have a quick question just about ETFs. Um, and the way our company um, play the gold is through ETFs with allocated gold. Do you have concerns about even those ETFs not meeting their obligation? Or as, long as, it, as long as it's allocated gold um, and it's, it's stored in a jurisdiction um, <coughs> where there's proper rule of law, absolutely none at all. I, I, I would claim that um, Julian Baring and I invented the ETF, well, gold and also um, proved it in court in Florida. Um, and I actually think it's a one thing what it's done for people. It's enabled people to, to uh, who couldn't hold gold, invest, investment managers who couldn't hold gold, actually to them. But I think some of the ETFs which are um, not physical uh, are dangerous. Um, if the price of gold is currently artificially depressed through political 
manipulation. What is it that needs to happen to actually have the price of gold reflect its uh, more realistic value in the marketplace? Well, I think that the method that has been used to suppress it um, is huge uh, sales of gold that then exists on the COMEX market, the, the, on the futures market. Um, in the London, in the London bullion market, um, fractional reserve banking allowed a certain amount of that to go on, but in, but in, in, in on the campex, we're talking about some really gigantic numbers. And, and, and if you look at the world gold production um, and the number of the tiny amount of gold that actually exists in the world, um, to have this vast paper market unsupported by, by gold, physical gold, uh, makes it a very a very difficult thing to do. No, nobody's ever stood for delivery successfully on the campus. Um, in, a, in a former life, I stood, well, my company stood for delivery uh, on the, uh, the cocoa market here in London. We took delivery of 98% of, 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 of one of one contract. Um, it can happen. If somebody had a go at the government's market and stood for delivery, there are, as of, as of last night, only 290,000 ounces of go available uh, for delivery. Can I ask a question? If, you know, if, if the price of gold is being artificially deflated, and there's all sorts of mechanisms for doing this, there's obviously a reason for this. Presumably, the situation is as soon as that necessity goes away, or somebody can work out how to deal with it. Because I mean, there's obviously a problem boiling up here. So essentially, we need we need something to happen that negates the need for the price of gold to be depressed. Wonder what that is. Um, because it's clearly being depressed for a reason, as you, as you said. So, what 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 what, it, what is it? What's going to happen that's just going to go ping and suddenly? It's not going to be the problem, gold rising to the people who currently is a problem too. We nearly had an answer known about, uh, I think it was about six months, nine months ago, that Germany asked for its money back, from, its gold back from, from uh, America. Um, and having made quite a big stage about wanting it back, it, it, it went very quiet. Uh, and I think that um, the only gold they got back, they got one delivery back which came from Paris. Um, so although it's not necessarily an answer to your question, it was very, I mean, there are a lot of people who rightly or wrongly think that there's no gold left in Fort Knox. It's been unaudited since 1924. No one ever goes and looks at it, so they, you've only got the word of successive presidents and it's there. But when Jeremy asked for some delivery, it wasn't forthcoming. So that's why these theories of manipulation arise, uh, and you haven't really got an answer that a whole load of these incidents build up and make people more and more suspicious about the American manipulation of the market. No smoke without fire. I think that, if I recall correctly, the Americans wrote an official letter back to Germany saying that they would be happy to return their gold and it would take them eight years to do it. <laughs> Go for um, it. Aren't we missing a trick on this one? It's not a question of gold going up, but the paper currency is going down. Your thoughts, please. I think the, the ability for um, central banks and for the policymakers to be able to keep the, uh, the, the belief in the currencies, I think, is coming towards a, uh, a bigger amount of questioning than we've seen uh, probably over the last 20 years. Like, for me, I, I guess what I've maybe learned over the last five years is that things sometimes feel like they take longer to, uh, to happen. I mean, you look at the Eurozone, it should break up, and it, it doesn't, and it seems to keep on ticking over and ticking over. And I think that we, we have to be careful to remember that the, there's a, an unbelievable amount of vested interest in the world in terms of the way that the political systems are set up and the way the economic systems are set up that will be acting to try and defend this. And so um, I think, you know, I, 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 don't, I, I don't personally subscribe to the view that gold is uh, being manipulated. 
I think there's uh, there's there's market forces at play that have done that. I think there are some undeniable um, pieces of evidence that show there are funny things that are happening. Um, but I don't believe that there's necessarily a, uh, a, a sort of central bank cabal or conspiracy that's holding it down necessarily. Um, but I do think that the ability for central banks and for governments around the world with these unfettered credit cycles that just keep continuing, I think that the ability for them to keep all the balls in the air is getting much more um, difficult as we go forward, which is some of the volatility that, uh, that we were speaking about earlier. So that's just my view. Okay, so what are, what are the chances of uh, old ownership being made legal at some point in the future? It has happened before. Do you think it might happen again? They always say that history. They always say that history is a very good predictor of, of the future. And it's not so long ago, in, well within my lifetime, it was in uh, in the U.S. And the existence of the Kruger Run uh, was happened because that was a way of allowing uh, UK, or sorry, U.S. investors to earn go. I think, such is the extent that money's been printed, it's impossible. Oh, yeah, it, money's just in free flow. I mean, every country is printing, printing as much as it can. I don't think it's an issue that will rear its head particularly because it, it's an impossibility. You might find one particular country might do it. China might decide that they can afford to do it and do it, but I don't think we are, I mean, I can't see Europe as a whole bringing it back. It just, it just will not happen. I've got a question on silver. Um, I'm speculating to sum this up. It's usually better to buy silver this time of the cycle rather than gold. Would you prove that? Silver has been a really disappointing performer compared with gold. It always used to move in a, a fairly regular uh, ratio. Um, it's. Uh, I would agree that silver is undervalued, and I think you know, it does play a part in people's portfolios. The big problem for silver is still the vast majority is a byproduct of lead zinc production. So um, whereas a, if the gold price collapsed, you just wouldn't produce gold. If, if the silver price um, collapsed, there were still, the economies weren't looking bad and they were still producing a lot of lead and zinc, then you would still get a lot of silver produced as well. So it's, it's suffered, I think, for, for that, but I would think at, at 15 bucks a, an ounce against the 12.50 for silver, you look at it very closely. It's also interesting to note, with silver, it, they used to call, th there was a beta on silver. Gold went down one, silver went down two, and vice versa. In this recent cycle, silver hasn't performed in the same way. And I think a lot of that has to, do, a lot of that has to do with the fact that as mentioned, 70% of the world's silver production is byproduct production, so it happens no matter what, so they're slightly overproducing. But also 50% of, silver used to all be used in money and savings and jewelry, the way gold was. Um, now, silver, something like 50% of its use is industrial. So the nature of silver as a precious metal is changing a bit, and I think that's changing the dynamic of how silver trades as well. Oh, it's agreed. actually early days uh, in, Mando, in the cycle of the silver form. But if you go and look at the chart of the uh, ratio of the gold and the silver price, you'll see it at its worst level uh, today. It's about 80 to 1. And it got to that level, I think, about uh, four or five years ago. But that's been, you know, those are the real bulls of gold. In time, when gold really gets moving, I think you probably will see the silver price. I, see, I think you'll see that ratio narrow back to somewhere perhaps in the sort of 50s and that gives you quite a big upside in the story. I would tend and to agree. A bit later, uh, of the gold really has got moving. Uh, I was just about to say, as long as that, uh, as that relationship uh, between gold and silver, as long as there is some element of silver that is a precious metal, then uh, yeah, you, you sensibly have to think that as you see a turnaround in the sentiment for gold, with silver being a thinner market, that that should be a uh, pretty reasonable, um, a pretty reasonable place to be. Any other questions, or, or are you all desperate for a drink? <laughs> okay, so, uh, is not the, let's say, relative stability in the price of gold, is that not a precursor to the recovery in the underlying companies? I mean, uh, Tom's a great healer, but, but I mean, without that foundation, 
you know, you, you're really on dodgy ground. Notwithstanding the fact that obviously the man made a good presentation on the juniors, we, we've been for hell and back with them, but there are a number now that have moved down the line, they're getting nearer to production. I, I personally think, like any other sector, the, the problem with this sector at the moment is there's the cash isn't being generated. There's nothing really to value on liquid. And other assets across other sectors, you can get that pound cash, you can get a dividend. As soon as we get that cash coming out of the ground, with that stable gold price, we can see what it's worth, and you're going to have some startling stories. But you know, there must be queuing up. Yeah, mining, mining companies have always been pretty parsimonious with dividends, and it's something yeah. which has been brought up over and over again. And there are a lot of companies in Australia, I think, um, well, a number of them have had huge turnaround in their profits and they still have yet to mention dividends and I couldn't agree with you more that they, uh, when they go through bad times there's a psychological exercise that takes place and they, they hate parting with any of their money but it's up to shareholders when, when you get presentations say look you know we run funds at one income and uh, and when you start paying dividends it has happened I know um, Peter's son who came out at BlackRock and, uh, and said right we, we now are going to invest more and more in companies that pay dividends and I think it will happen, but rather than can afford to pay them now, it's a real change. There's also a really interesting companies that consistently pay dividends in, in the gold space, tra trade at much better multiples. The markets, they trust the dividend players. It's, it's a discipline that's very much appreciated by investors. Well, gold is cash, isn't it? You know, get it out of the ground, give us some. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think if, if you want to invest in a junior, you're not investing for the dividend. And I think you need to understand where the junior comes from and the junior is there to make the discovery, to get that excitement and the share price going. That's why you invest in the junior. You don't invest in the junior for a dividend. I think that's where, as an investor, you need to position yourself and understand that. Um, because a good geologist doesn't necessarily make a good gold producer. Nor a good manager either. Not any sense to invest in the junior. Right. Well, you're going to get a lot more sex in the junior, yeah. <laughs> um, Gavin? Hi, I, this is really an adjunct to Peter's question. How, how difficult is it to actually run a, a small mining company? Um, I'm the ad again now. I used to be a big one. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not that difficult. Um, after 22 years uh, in Russia now, um, we've got a very well organized, um, well managed team on the ground, employing about 10,000 people in two shifts. Um, a management structure that is now very lean uh, in London because we're listed here for no other reason. Um, and uh, I think there are probably four people in the company who don't speak Russian. So uh, it really isn't that difficult. And as an analyst, this is my least favorite question to ever uh, answer. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine it's very difficult to be able to stop versus being an analyst or you know, opining on these things rather than running. So. I think one of the things that has been argued about the mining industry is very often technical people who are excellent geologists and excellent engineers are put in a position where they're required to make business decisions and fundamentally a mining company is a business and and that is something not a science project and not an engineering project um, in the last cycle two of the companies major companies that did better than almost any of the other major companies uh, were Extrata and Glencore. And interestingly, both of those companies were run by accountants. Um, there's something to be said for the fact that uh, the mine, and I think a lot of them, I truly believe actually that the mining industry has learned a lot over the last few years. Um, and, and that their financial discipline was what many of them were lacking. And, and a very long, hard, bare cycle has, has has taught a lot of them that lesson. But when you're looking to invest in it, in a mining company, whether it's a junior company or a larger company, you're gonna have to look hard at financial discipline. Um, and I think that's one of them, for, from my point of view, when I'm looking at them, that, that's one of the first things that I look at.
One of the interesting things when you talk about running a mine, it's much easier to develop a small gold mine than just about anything else. You can't really develop a small base metal mine because the process is so expensive. It's going to cost you half a billion or more to develop it. If you take some of this little company in Australia, Blackham, it's got a short 500,000 ounces, and it's going to put it into production, and uh, the cost of that probably going to get away with $100 million. So gold mining, you don't have to have a huge deposit to put it in production. And as a rule of thumb, you do have to have a huge deposit to put a, a base metal mine into production. So it's um, if, if, if you have got a steadily rising gold price, I would say the management of a gold company is probably easier than almost any other type of natural resource. The recently opened ABX allocated uh, bullion exchange two weeks ago, will that have any impact on the marketplace or on the pricing? I'm too far away from the market to be able to Sorry. Yeah, I probably thought so. Um, one quick, I thought people might ask what what signs you look for if it, you know, that give you the encouragement that the market is turning. And if I can use one small example, there's a not the greatest exploration company in Australia called Bedell. Its, it's asset is not in Australia, which is always a bit of a deterrent sometimes when people look for excuses not to invest. But it had built up a, a reasonable resource. Uh, and it went to raise $50 million, I think it was either the last week or the week before. And I knew it was going well because I didn't get a call from the broker. Uh, and in fact, it turned out it was three times oversubscribed. And I can tell you categorically that money would not have been raised certainly six months ago and probably not three months ago. So, and if you look at what's going on in Canada, very quietly, there have been a lot of fundraisings going on. Uh, and one of the reasons, again, there's always psychology in this, is that if, if a fund manager has decided he's, he, he's a generous fund, he is going to put some money to the gold market, he might think the markets are too thin, but if there's a big placing going on, he can get stuck into five or $10 million worth of the stock at a go, rather than giving an order to a broker and the stock might move up and end up with a very small holding. So there are all sorts of signs to look for, but one thing that's been very noticeable, the last three months, there's been a real pickup in the amount of money that's been raised. And if you, and against that, you try and go and raise money for an emerging copper mine, you've got just about no chance whatsoever. So once again, it's an illustration why the gold market is giving you the positive signs. Are we um, seeing a return to hedging? I ask that particularly because we've seen Acacia and uh, Harmony, I think, announce some, some hedging. Um, I, I know a lot of people are bullish, but if you're a miner and you were producing at close to 1050 a few months ago, you know these prices must, must be looking fairly attractive as a, as a hedging position. I was just going to mention um, back about some of the signs about management uh, changing and how the industry is different. And Acacia was actually an example. I was with Brad the other day discussing uh, Buswagi. And uh, that mine just has got one year left and then it'll be processing tailings. Um, it is not the most profitable mine. And um, one of the questions that, that, that came up in the meeting I was in was uh, if the gold price goes back up, do you change your plans around Buswagi? I said, no, no way. We're not, we're not doing anything with that. That's not a mine for us because, you know, we need to have a certain return. We can't just, because we could possibly increase the ounces and get a small margin for that. That's not what this is about anymore. And that's exactly why a company goes to hedge the, uh, the, the production from there to be able to lock in a return that they feel is commensurate or at least better than, you know, getting nothing. I think hedging is a, uh, is a very useful tool for mining companies uh, to be able to manage their risk, which is what any company should be doing. Where hedging uh, gets a bad rap was in the last cycle, whereby you had everybody had hedged through a period of very flat prices, and this hedge books caused massive uh, deterioration to equity uh, value and equity performance. Uh, but outside of having made bad hedges, um, in a situation where you believe there is going to be a short Time period where you need to lock in cash flow. Uh, I think I think it's something that that adds to the uh, to the credibility of management. So I think you will likely see a, a small return to that, um, especially because a lot of companies have gone through changes in the last three years where they, the outlook did look like it was not going to be able to uh, be something that would persist. Um, I know Peter's uh, done some hedging in the past. I'll pass this to you. 
I think we were the first of the, um, the sort of serious mining companies to hedge on the way down from 1900. I think we, so about 15, 1600, we started hedging. Um, and we have a policy, a published policy, of hedging 50% of 18 months production. And we are currently very, very under hedged at the moment. Um, we're way off that. Now, <clears throat> one of the reasons for that is the very difficult circumstances prevailing in the world markets because we are in Russia and we operate in Russia, uh, it has to be Russian companies that do the hedging, otherwise it's tax inefficient. And the Western banking system doesn't do Russia, uh, and that means that the Russian banks themselves that are our natural hedging counterparties have difficulty doing anything for any length of time. So. It, it, it's not as easy as it sounds. I, I, I wouldn't mind being hedged a bit more at this sort of price, but it's very difficult to actually to achieve it. I think you'll find that a number of Australian companies will hedge there. I say today the price was nearly an all-time high. Mm. And I've got to say, if I was a producer, you know, when we're all we're always there on the side of optimism, but if you're looking at almost an all-time high price, there has to be the temptation to hedge 10 or 20 percent of the production just in case, and the Aussie dollar's down 40% uh, in, in about two years, uh, you know, and, and most people say it's going to go down further, which probably means it's going to start recovering, so um, I, I, I would think that there will be a lot of temptation to hedge at this relatively high level, whether it happens in America, where of course it's, it's reflecting a very strong currency, is a different thing altogether. Sorry, Mr. Hambro, couldn't you just hedge swap with another producer? Uh, yes, I, I probably could if I could find somebody who is prepared to do it. Uh, the, 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 there is a fantastic absence of there is a fantastic absence of credit um, around the world, um, and we can see the banks have been given vast amounts of money by QE and the various other things that the Americans have done. And all that's happened is that money has gone back on deposit with the central bank, even at negative interest rates. And none of the banks are prepared to take any uh, credit risk on anybody. And, and if the banks won't take credit risk, then how could companies, uh, intercompany credit risks be extended? When we're talking about you know, big sums of big sums of money, we probably are, are annual production <coughs> again of a billion dollars. So, um, to make it worthwhile, you'd have to have some very big potential risks. Now, from our point of view, uh, the only risk is if the gold price goes up and we can't produce. Um, but that's not a risk that, that um, anybody sees to take. Dr. Wally, Peter, at the start you poo-pooed internet research and what you believe on the other, but are there, and this goes to all of you, sources that you would rely on that are freely available for listed companies for investment research? Anyone? Yes, I think there are. Um, we now have a, uh, a very big non-institution shareholder base in terms of number of shareholders. Um, and there are a couple of, of uh, internet magazines almost um, that we do broadcasts on and I think that that is a very good way of getting our story across and, and, and reading, the, reading the company's website uh, is also a way to do it. But I think the, the, the downside is looking at the there's a chat room called London South East, which it has cleverly abbreviated LSE to make everybody think it's the London Stock Exchange. Um, and that is something that is entirely used, as far as I can make out, by, by people wanting to do insider trading. From my point of view, um, it's quite boring, but the reality is 
one of the best sources of information if you really want to know about a company is to, to look at their accounts. Um, the first place I always go before I meet management or anything else is read through their last set of management accounts. And, and, and see their presentation on their website, see what they have to say first. Um, and that can, if you know how to read them and you're willing to slog through them, can give you a pretty accurate picture of where they're at, um, in, in my opinion. <laughs> um, I'll give you the opportunity to win a much bigger drink. <laughs> supposed to be real gold in there. <laughs> All right, Harvinder Hungen. The very big bottle, come on. physical gold allocated in vaults around the world at the choice of our customers. Now recently, well, I think about halfway through last year, we were acquired by a company called Bitgold, which is a Canadian corporation, which has cracked the payments of, um, uh, if you like, of gold through uh, a, a, a debit card. And uh, I have here a gold one, and the gold money uh, series is, going, is, is um, uh, going to be released very, very soon. Um, Bit gold itself is growing extremely rapidly, and I wish Dominic was here because I would tell him that we have over three quarters of a million customers on the Bit gold platform now, all around the world. I can tell you that what Bit gold have achieved is they have um, uh, drawn a line under Gresham's law, whereby the bad money drives out the good. The good money is coming back into circulation, and I would say not before time. Gold is money, which is your point, Amanda, and I agree with you wholly. So anyway, I'm turning to the matter in hand. Um, I'm very, very pleased to present this to Peter, who makes light of all the management expertise he has in running a gold mine in very difficult circumstances. And if, I, if we were to believe him, him, that it is so easy, and actually you've just got to have tons and grams and so on, then why is it that so many gold mines actually fail? I think you're being very modest, and that is for you, and thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. It's so strange to think of a plastic cup being anything to do with gold, but... Uh, <laughs> gold. It's, it's gold. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much indeed. I, I, I think I'll probably stick with my ten toler bar as as, as, <laughs> as a change. But, but thank you very much, and I'm, I'm definitely some money. 